So I try to condense in uh, 40 minutes, which is not much, much uh, what um, ESA does in Earth observation, which means studying the planet from, from above, from satellites, and then how this observation can be used to monitor and to help in the management of natural hazards. So um, for those who are new here, because uh, some teacher came to the last gifts, I just make a small introduction of ESA. It's, a, um, it's an organization, it's an international organization with uh, uh, 19 member states, which work for the development of space technology and, te and space science for exclusively um, peaceful purposes. So we don't deal with any uh, military applications. We have uh, member states all over Europe and all also uh, outside Europe because uh, Norway and Switzerland are also members of the European Space Agency and Canada also is helping us, is cooperating with us. Uh, the location where ESA is uh, are overall in Europe and uh, we have, uh, uh, for example, in, e in Italy where I work in Estrin, we have the Center for Earth Observation. And we also have a, a large establishment in, in uh, Holland. It's the largest establishment, is ESTEC, where the satellites are really assembled and tested and designed, and uh, other stations uh, worldwide. Maybe the most uh, well-known is the one in Kourou, where the uh, satellites and the launchers are sent into orbit, into space. Kourou is part of Europe, as you, as you know. It's part of the French territory, that's why and also because it's on the equator, of course, and close to the sea, so many reasons. Uh, we don't work only in uh, Earth observation. We have many directorates, many activities, ranging from uh, human space flight, uh, exploration, launches, telecommunications. But of course, the most relevant uh, uh, program in the case of um, disaster monitoring and natural hazard management is Earth observation. However, it's not the only one. I was thinking about that just uh, uh, 10 minutes ago. There are other activities uh, of ESA which can be relevant for um, disaster management and for uh, natural hazards. But I let you think about it during the presentation and you'll tell me at the end of, of the presentation if you have any idea of uh, any of these uh, programs which can be uh, relevant for natural hazards. Sorry. So, for example, telecommunication or uh, space science. But you should tell me why. If you can think about any natural hazard which is not just related to Earth observation, but to these other activities. So, Earth observation, it's a very large field of uh, uh, work and activities. And uh, um, wha what does it mean, Earth observation? So, Earth. Uh, the Earth is not only uh, land, it's also water, so oceans, and it's also the core of the Earth, so the inner part of the, of the Earth, and uh, the atmosphere, so it's uh, Earth in the wide sense. It's an uh, observation because we are studying and monitoring the Earth from space, uh, so we have uh, satellites which are rotating uh, around the Earth and which are taking observations all the time with sensors. Sensors are these artificial eyes of the satellites. They are like cameras, but they are not only cameras. There are many more sensors, uh, which take all the time images of the Earth as the satellite is rotating about the Earth and as the Earth is rotating on its own axis. And it's remote because the satellite is far away and it takes um, observation of the Earth without physical contact with the Earth. Of course, not only satellites do remote sensing. You do also remote sensing all the time with your eyes. These are also uh, remote sensors. So there are different types of uh, satellites uh, which observe the Earth. There are geostationary satellites. They are called geostationary because they are stationary with respect to the Earth in the sense that they rotate around the equator or the equatorial plane with the same angular speed as the Earth. So when you look at the satellite from the Earth, it moves exactly with the same speed of the Earth, and you have the impression it is stationary. So they are far away from the Earth. They are six times the Earth radius, uh, so 36,000 kilometers from the Earth's surface. And um, this is the type of image that they can acquire. So you see it's the whole hemisphere. And uh, when you zoom, so this is nice, isn't it? Yeah. But, but when you zoom on a, a small area, it's less nice. <laughs> huh? 
because it gives a global overview of the uh, hemisphere, so it's good for meteorology, for example. It is less good when you want to do um, Earth observation <laughs> for a specific area, because the space resolution, of course, is not so good. Then we have developed other types of satellites, which are polar orbiters, sorry, um, these type of uh, satellites, <coughs> they uh, rotate around the Earth and they almost contain the North and the South Pole in their orbit. So there is a combination, as you can guess, of this type of orbit together with the Earth rotation. And in this way, after a certain number of orbits, you can map all the Earth. So you don't look always at the same hemisphere as we did in the previous case. Now we are mapping the whole Earth. And now um, with this type of satellite, which are much closer to the Earth, and they bear many different sensors, you can have much better or much more um, accurate, much more resolute images of the Earth, which are much nicer for somebody who's looking at uh, specific details. Uh, you can recognize, I'm sure, this, uh, uh, this area of the world, this, uh, the pyramids, and you can see uh, with the modern satellites, very high resolution, how well you can uh, see the Earth features, like being on an uh, aeroplane almost. And when you have many of these satellites, of these polar satellites, then you don't have to wait for a long time before you see any point of the Earth, because you can almost always find a satellite which is close to an area of interest at any time. And this is very important, of course, for uh, natural hazards, because you don't want to have to wait days or weeks before you can see a specific point. If there is a, an earthquake um, today in Italy, I need to be able to pass over Italy very quickly. And if I have only one of these polar satellites, it can take weeks before I can really see uh, that specific point, because I need to wait for the specific combination between the Earth rotation and the um, position of the satellite along its orbit. The type of instruments which are used on, on board these satellites are of uh, sp different ranges. Uh, they use different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, the most uh, the easiest uh, type of sensor to understand are optical satellites, which are um, using the visible and the infrared and the near infrared part of the spectrum. Uh, this is uh, similar to what you can see with your eyes. Uh, and now I'm talking about the visible uh, uh, part of the spectrum. And uh, these uh, images are uh, typical of passive sensors because they don't, they just record the uh, sun illumination, which is uh, reflected back to the sensor. So they are like cameras, of course they are much more complex, and they record um, images of the Earth which are similar to what you could see from a, a spacecraft which is flying high in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. This is Rondonia in Brazil. These are, uh, this is a series of different uh, um, optical acquisitions taken uh, during time, and uh, uh, this is a near-infrared acquisition. Uh, with this type of uh, images, you can perform, for example, classification and um, detect different classes of um, uh, territory, like uh, cultivated, uh, agricultural, forest, uh, urban, and so on, desert, and so on. Uh, you can also study the chlorophyll consent, uh, content of water uh, and the uh, suspended matters. This is important for many natural hazards that we will see later on. You can also uh, use the thermal infrared part of the spectrum, uh, which is basically um, sensible to uh, radiation of uh, temperature. And this is also used by passive sensors. So they just record the, this information about temperature, which is um, sent by the Earth's surface. And this is an application, for example, of uh, uh, water um, temperature on the same area as before, Rondonia where the different type of uh, uh, or the different ranges of temperature are colored artificially with different colors. So this is a palette of colors which are associated to different temperatures. And this is important for natural hazards because, for example, over sea or over ocean, the water temperature is uh, correlated with the formation of hurricanes. And finally, uh, which is the most um, uh, interesting sensor for me, which is radar, because I'm a radar engineer, 
and they use the microwave part of the spectrum. This has a, a big advantage to the ranges that we uh, saw before because this is a, um, a part of the spectrum which, is, uh, which has a much lower uh, atmospheric absorption. So uh, it, it means that the, this type of information can pass through clouds and is not uh, depending on the uh, atmospheric conditions. So you can acquire or you can get information with the optical sensor only when there are no clouds. Otherwise you see, of course, the top of the atmosphere which is just covered by clouds. But with radar uh, sensors which go through the atmosphere in the microwave part of the spectrum, um, so the, the, the instrument is send, it's an active sensor because it is sending a, a, a microwave um, um, signal. So it's a wave which penetrates the clouds and then is reflected back to the sensor, at least in part. And this is, um, can be acquired day and night because it's an active sensor, so it sends its own illumination, doesn't need the sun, and also it's uh, uh, not depending on the atmospheric condition. This is very important for natural hazards because we don't want to be depending on the atmospheric conditions. Sometimes, or often, uh, natural hazards are connected even with the presence of clouds, in, as in the case of hurricanes or uh, floods which come from rain. So having a sensor which is not uh, uh, sensitive to the presence of clouds is very important for civil protection and for natural hazard observation. And this is the same area as before, Rondonia, now observed with a radar sensor. You see how different it is. This is just one of the possible applications of radar sensor. It's a digital elevation model, so the topography can be derived very easily from radar measurements. And this is just a, a number of satellites which have been developed so far by ESA. So a lot of them uh, are launched already, and many are still to be, to be launched. I will explain you later what this uh, specific satellite can do for um, natural hazard observation. This is the biggest satellite that we ever launched. It was called Envisat, which we've been operating for 10 years. And uh, you see how big it is compared to the size of a man. And it bears many different uh, instruments which can be used for um, disaster management and disaster monitoring, sorry. You see many different applications. Uh, I'll try to explain some of them, at least those which are related to um, disaster um, and natural hazards. For example, using a satellite uh, radar, we can uh, observe uh, very easily the presence of water over land. And water appears black using radar images. Um, when you compare an image, a radar image taken before and during the flood, of course you can uh, easily understand where water has appeared and making a change detection in the same way as we saw in the previous presentation for landslide, we can put in evidence areas which were not covered by water before and which are covered by water during the satellite pass. So in this way, irrespective of the presence of clouds, day or night, we can detect very easily and very quickly um, floods. Another way to detect floods is just to make a color composite. So when you have a, a, a radar, a radar acquisition is just one band, so it's one channel. It's not like uh, uh, optical images. And when you uh, um, uh, make a color composite of different radar acquisitions which are taken in different times, for example, before and during the flood, and you associate each channel, each, sorry, each date with a different color, uh, for example, we blew uh, the presence of water, then you will see how um, uh, water appears in dark blue in the areas which are flooded. Mm? This is another way to detect automatically the presence of water using change detection with the um, radar images. This is another type of natural hazard which is easily um, detectable using radar images. It's an uh, oil spill. You hear more and more about oil spills on newspapers. And as you know, they are uh, very, uh, very important, very, very bad for the ecosystem. They can affect uh, heavily uh, not only the water, but also the costs for many decades. So it's important to be uh, timely um, capable of detecting this phenomena from space. Uh, you can compare uh, radar images, which is taken uh, on the 2nd of May of 2010, so the beginning of the oil spill. By the way, you can see on the radar images also these white spots, which are ships. Ships can be easily detected on radar images. And when you uh, combine this information also with the uh, information about uh, winds and currents, you can also forecast 
the uh, propagation of the oil spill in the days which follow. And that's very important for the civil protection so they can timely um, uh, try to protect the cost from the oil spill which is approaching. And here in this next image you will see how the oil spill has developed uh, um, over one month. So you see it's huge. This is the uh, cost, this is Orle New Orleans and this is the um, Louisiana uh, cost. So it has really become a huge um, oil spill in over one month. Uh, this is the oil spill over Mexico uh, in 2010. Uh, again, it appears in black over the sea. And uh, when you uh, compare it with the optical image, uh, you can see the oil spill again in this case. But uh, uh, it's quite rare because normally oil spills can be detected much better on radar images than op optical images. Uh, these are the Moscow fires. You can remember in the uh, summer 2011, um, close to Moscow, there were these huge fires which have uh, been polluting um, the air over Moscow for many months. So these are also very important natural hazards which can be monitored from space. And they can be monitored either with the optical images where you just see the presence of smo smoke, basically, or also um, thermal uh, infrared where you can see the temperature especially at night, when you have a higher contrast between the, the fire and land. Uh, this is a thermal uh, infrared image where you can see the fires in different spots. Uh, and uh, anybody is able to recognize this type of hazard? Yeah, it's a volcano. It's uh, in uh, Iceland. Oh, sorry. Um, it was called Eia Fialatola, something like that. It's uh, the word which nobody can pronounce. And uh, it was, um, well, it was not a real effect in population, but it was affecting the, uh, the atmosphere and the, the sky, and uh, it was difficult to fly for many months uh, everywhere in Europe. You see how well it can be seen from space, obviously. And uh, so volcanic monitoring is something which is very useful, um, usefully observed from space. Uh, for many reasons. One is that, for example, looking, looking at the atmosphere, we can see the volcanic plume, uh, which is going out in the atmosphere. Um, there are also instruments on board uh, um, satellites, like radars, which can detect the displacement, the ground displacement. And volcanic activity, of course, is uh, connected with the um, deformation of the ground, which is also taking place days before the eruption. So differently from earthquakes, uh, volcanic eruptions can uh, often uh, be um, predicted using uh, a, a wide range of measurements, including uh, uh, space measurements. And uh, also uh, lava flows can be detected from space. And of course, uh, this is the type of phenomena where you cannot go very close to the volcano and observe it, unless it is in a place like Italy, where we have observatories and a lot of um, um, sensors there. But for remote areas, uh, and dangerous uh, um, phenomena like volcanic activity is very important to have satellites flying over all the time. Uh, this is a hurricane um, in the Caribbean uh, Sea, which is uh, sea by radar. So you can ask, how come radar see a hurricane? We just saw, we just said the that the, the atmosphere is transparent to radar, so the radar doesn't see the atmosphere; it goes through. So how can we see a hurricane? from radar. Anybody has an idea? Uh, no? Water, yeah, the water. The, uh, this is water, in fact, we are over the sea. So we, we are not seeing the hurricane. We are seeing the effect of the hurricane over the water. Huh? And uh, in fact, the, there are currents and there are waves which are formed by uh, the wind. Uh, so these waves and currents are uh, obviously related to the presence of the hurricane. You can see here the eye of the hurricane. You see it's darker because there is less wind, so less uh, rugosity on the water. And here we have the same hurricane uh, taken uh, at the same time uh, from another sensor. Now it's an optical sensor on board of the same satellite. So there were two simultaneous sensors and uh, we could take simultaneous observation of the hurricane now, uh, of course, we, uh, in the optics, we don't see the water because the uh, information stops on the top of the atmosphere. The optical image doesn't penetrate the atmosphere. So what we are seeing now is the top of the atmosphere. So first, 
we saw the um, air, uh, sorry, the, the sea surface, and now we see the top of the atmosphere. And this is again the eye of the uh, cyclone seen by these different instruments. When we compare different acquisitions, for example, optical acquisitions, but also radar acquisitions of the hurricane over time, we can see the trajectory of the hurricane and also um, help scientists to predict its evolution over time and where it will go in the next days or in the next hours. Uh, and another thing which is very important for scientists is to be able to have at the same time simultaneous acquisition, sorry, simultaneous uh, uh, information from different bands or from different sensors of the same hurricane because this can help scientists to better model the hurricane in its uh, whole. So here, for example, for the same hurricane, we have the radar images which shows the, um, the rugosity of the water, as we saw before. Here, also from radar instruments, we can derive the wind uh, direction and the wind strength. Uh, this is uh, basically derived from the previous image. And then uh, also we can study the currents, sea currents, also from radar images. So when we put together all this information together with the optical acquisitions of the sky and the atmosphere, scientists can uh, uh, develop a much better and more complete model of the hurricane itself. And that's important, of course, to um, model, of course, the propagation of the hurricane. Um, another type of natural hazard, which can be detected from space, are algal blooms. Uh, these are um, connected with the presence of a certain uh, uh, dangerous algas uh, in, in, the, in water. And this can be uh, dangerous for uh, fish, but also for, for men. And uh, um, this can be very easily seen using optical images when there are no clouds, obviously. Uh, again, over sea, another type of application. This is also, again, with radar. Uh, I don't know if somebody uh, can remember what happened uh, in Italy with the Costa Concordia ship. Uh, uh, when was it? One or two years ago now? And uh, uh, ships can be very well seen uh, from space using radar uh, instruments. In fact, something which I forgot to tell you is that these radar images are not only used by scientists, but they are used all the time by um, organizations like EMSA. EMSA is the European Maritime uh, Safety uh, Agency, and uh, with, uh, which deals with safety uh, all over, all over um, uh, Mediterranean and, and the um, sea around Europe. And they use all the time, they acquire all the time uh, radar images from Europe and from Canada as well to uh, study, the, to monitor the presence of ships and also the presence of uh, oil spills. So they can connect, for example, an oil spill which is just forming with the presence of ship and they can send the information then to the Coast Guards which immediately go and uh, put a fine uh, to the ships which are responsible of the oil spills or which are uh, waste, uh, washing their reservoirs in water because some of these uh, um, things are not accidental, they are done on purpose. Uh, iceberg can be studied very well from uh, radar satellites, and uh, since the satellites are polar, as I told you, they pass all the time over the south and the north pole, uh, and the orbit lasts just one and a half hours, so it means that every, every 90 minutes the satellite is doing a complete orbit around the Earth. It means that uh, every uh, one and a half hours, so 14 or 15 times per day, we have uh, images uh, over the uh, Arctic and the Antarctic. And since these areas are often covered with clouds, uh, this is the only way to have a continuous monitoring of the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, a daily with a, uh, with a frequency of a few hours. And therefore, icebergs can be also studied uh, by uh, this type of satellites. And here we have a nice animation which shows uh, the uh, formation of a, a huge iceberg in the Antarctica. So this is important, of course, for uh, scientists which study Arctic and Antarctic, but also for navigation. Uh, and talking again about uh, um, natural hazards, uh, uh, um, earthquakes can be studied from space uh, in different ways. And in particular, using radar instruments, it's possible to study the ground measurements produced by an earthquake. Of course, this is possible only 
after the earthquake has, has happened. And this is done also by a sort of comparison. Now it's not comparison of the, uh, of the image itself, it's a comparison of the face of the radar image. I will not go into the details, but just to tell you that using these radar instruments from space at the height of 800 kilometers, which is the height of uh, um, polar orbiters, it is possible to uh, detect the deformation produced by an earthquake with an accuracy of uh, centimeters or millimeters. So what you see here is the um, uh, deformation field of the earthquake of BAM in Iran. And uh, these uh, uh, different colors just show a deformation of a few centimeters. In fact, each, uh, um, each fringe, a fringe is when you go from a color to the same color, corresponds to uh, 28 millimeter of deformation. So imagine how precise these instruments are. From a height of 800 kilometers, you can detect a displacement of 28 millimeter over a surface which can be 100 by 100 kilometers. Imagine how many GPS receivers you should need on this area in order to have the same type of information and how expensive it would be. This is uh, um, a, an animation. Oh, no, no it's, it's fine, it's fine. Which just shows you uh, the, um, it's an animation which is visualized in 3D where you see the deformation of Mount Etna. This is done over 10 years using radar instruments. And now you will see associated with different colors, you will see deformations of a few centimeters. Huh? So this is over 10 years. You can see how the Etna inflates and deflates uh, a long uh, time in 10 years. Uh, and of course, this is related to the presence of magma in the magmatic chamber. Uh, this can uh, look very tiny, very small, of course, the formation of uh, 10 centimeters, but it is, of course, on a huge surface. It's a huge mountain, so you can imagine how uh, important these phenomena are and how can uh, um, this uh, data also be related uh, to the study done by seismologists and volcanologists about the presence of magma in the uh, surface of the Earth and how this can help them better model um, uh, volcanic uh, eruptions, for example. Uh, this is uh, uh, another area. Uh, it's, it's again uh, um, um, a volcano. This is now uh, Vesuvius Mountain, close to Naples. And this is an area which is called Campi Flegrei, close to Naples, which is also moving all the time. Um, so uh, here, different colors are again representative of variations in the height of the surface of just a few centimeters. And we can see how um, scientists can relate this type of uh, um, deformation to the presence of underground phenomena. This cannot be detected from space, but uh, volcanologists can, uh, of course, use these models and uh, um, improve these models based on the deformation which can be observed uh, by satellites on top of the surface. So in this case, for example, uh, um, a reservoir of water is supposed to, uh, to be um, uh, below the Campi Flegrea area, and in fact it is its defla um, um, deformation uh, or change of volume which would uh, cause the deformation on the satellites, on the, on the Earth's grounds. And uh, so based on all this type of uh, information, not only ESA, but the space agencies uh, decided here in Vienna many years ago in 1999, and not in this room, but uh, just a few meters away in the um, United Nations, which is a building that you may have seen. So uh, there, uh, the European Space Agency and the French Space Agency uh, um, proposed or they promised that they would uh, join the forces in order to create an organization which was, would be able to uh, help um, civil protection to monitor and to map timely uh, natural hazard from space using their satellites. After that, many other agencies joined and uh, um, now we had more than 350 activations in the in last 10 years. It means that for 350 times this um, mechanism was activated in order to get satellite images of the Earth when there was a natural catastrophe. Uh, so the type of natural events, natural hazards, which are uh, uh, monitored uh, using uh, this international charter are earthquakes, fires, floods, 
landslides, tsunami, uh, volcanic eruption, and so on. But we also uh, monitor using this mechanism uh, man-made events like oil spills or industrial accidents. Uh, this is a, a, a just a, a statistic uh, or a, a, an information which is resuming the number of activation that we had every year and what type of uh, events caused these uh, activations. And when we look at this map, which is the geographic distribution of these activations, you can uh, get an idea which type of uh, disasters are the most uh, um, frequent, or at least those which are activated the most frequently. Uh, uh, and you see immediately that it is this color, this type of blue, um, fair blue, which is, active, uh, which is connected to the flood uh, uh, events. So flood are the most frequent type of uh, um, natural events, or so at least the most frequent which require the use of satellite observations. And then the second one is uh, earthquakes. You can also see the distribution of earthquakes. You can also uh, remark that uh, what I remarked yesterday that over Russia there are no disasters, <laughs> which is obviously not true, but it means at least we were never uh, request, uh, requested by Russia uh, to uh, activate this mechanism in order to provide them information. <coughs> Maybe they have their own means. Mm -hmm. These are the uh, space agencies which participate to, the, to this organization and which provide satellite data each time that there is a, an activation of the charter. Activation means that there is a natural disaster where, this, uh, where we are requested to uh, start acquiring data with our satellites and provide information to the civil protections. So this is an example of a charter activation over Greece. You can remember the, the fires which took place. Um, so using uh, uh, infrared uh, sensors, it is possible to easily map the, um, the areas where the fire uh, has been taking place. We can then uh, uh, create a map uh, where these uh, areas are superimposed to an optical image and uh, uh, given in geographical um, coordinates to the civil protection, which can easily uh, know uh, with a delay of a few hours. which was mapped uh, from space. And uh, um, here you can see uh, the um, damaged buildings by comparison of an, a Pleiad image. Pleiad is a, a, an image taken from the um, constellation of high resolution of French satellites, optical satellites. And damaged buildings can be easily detected by comparison of these two images, uh, just by change detection. And uh, was eruption which took place in, uh, um, in, uh, in Africa several, year ago, several years ago. And this is an animation example, where this uh, satellite image were uh, put in, in this uh, animation Republic and simulate uh, what you would see from a helicopter or from an aircraft which would be flying over the Rondo area of the eruption. So you can see that the um, lava flow, a few hours, of course, hundreds the, the, the of thousands of people had to flee their homes. Easily from space, but also in this case, what was in order to avoid further was chaos the, uh, and sorrow, lava the charter flow, was called uh, in to identify safe flat areas for refugee and camps. And its impact on the city. So when you compare the presence of lava flow in the local space, in three dimensions, also with the uh, location, and the current for example, of the infrastructures. Of the like bridges, with their uh, radar roads, and infrared railways, you can tell immediately the true protection where the heaviest damage quickly, have taken Which areas place. of the ground are not affected? 
And uh, here you have the web page of the charter. Uh, I invite you to go there because there is a, um, a, a site, uh, with a link, which is Charter for Schools, with presentations which are prepared for students or for teachers to be shown to uh, students. You will get this presentation anyway and all the videos which are contained in it. And also um, there is a, um, a link to the movie of the charter where you can uh, easily understand how the charter works and you will get examples of uh, uh, activations, so examples of uh, pro um, uh, maps produced by the charter and explanations uh, and comparison also between these maps and videos which were taken from ground where you can compare the satellite images with what, with what was really happening. The natural each year cause the death of hundreds of thousands of people, turn millions more uh, finally, for the future, what are we going to do for the future? We have seen the present, uh, we have seen the past. Uh, what's going to happen next? Europe has a, a, a program which is called GMES, now it's been called Copernicus, which is um, for the global monitoring for environment and security of, uh, uh, um, of Europe. And this is a, a, a program to provide us with the independent uh, information uh, about the environment and security all over Europe. This is done jointly by the European Union and ESA because ESA is producing, is uh, preparing the space segment, so the space part of this program, which means the satellites, uh, so the space component, the satellites, but also the ground segment. So the way to download the data from the satellites and provide it to the users. And integrate, and this is integrated by means of uh, specific services with uh, in situ measurements. So we are not using obviously only uh, measurement from space, but also measurements which are taken on the ground. And there are services which integrate all these measurements and provide the information finally to the citizen, to the civil protection, and to the organizations in charge of uh, security and envir environmental monitoring. Um, so ESA is developing a series of satellites. You remember at the beginning I showed you many satellites which are developed by ESA and the most important now is the Sentinel series. These are um, uh, satellites which are dedicated to the uh, study and the monitoring of the environment for operational applications, also science, but mainly operational. And the first of them, which will be launched in uh, this year, at the end of 2013, is Sentinel-1, which is a radar mission. We have seen how important radar are for many types of natural hazards, and this is a dedicated radar mission, which will provide continuous information to citizens and to um, service providers for the future. And then there will be other satellites, which will be launched in 2014, and so on, for the study, uh, for the monitoring of the sea, of the atmosphere, and so on. Um, so there are many services which are being developed, which are already pre-operational, based on present satellites, like uh, emergency management response, uh, to provide uh, with the uh, um, timely information about, for example, uh, disaster location, disaster events, but also land monitoring, marine environmental monitoring, climate change, and so on. And uh, uh, the type of services which are developed use similar type of uh, uh, information as I showed you before. So I will not go into the details. For earthquakes, for example, you can uh, uh, detect the um, position of the, the uh, uh, buildings which have been damaged, but also the ground displa displacement, which is uh, possible to use to get by interferometry from radar satellites. There are land subsidences. Uh, this is also um, very interesting. It's an application which is uh, based on the use of radar satellites. And this is an example uh, of a, a service that we uh, could provide over Venice. This is something which has been done so far using uh, um, MVSAT or ERS data. And this is something which uh, now is stopped because the uh, ERS satellite and MBSAT are no longer existing. But from the end of 2013, we will provide this uh, information continuously, for example, to the civil protection, and they will be able to monitor all the time the displacement over large cities. Huh? This is Venice, uh, where the colors are associated to subsidence in millimeters <coughs> per year, so just a few millimeters per year. Uh, this is, uh, has been done uh, using a uh, satellite like ERS and uh, MVSAT, but now we have a very high resolution satellites, also for radar. For example, Germany has developed the um, TerraSAR-X <coughs> constellation, which is a very 
accurate um, type of uh, radar measurements where we have uh, a very small space solution, less than one meter. And that's why we can now study and monitor the deformation, not only of areas, but of single buildings. You see how dense these measurements are. And uh, you will see in a few seconds a zoom of the Piazza San Marco in Venice and how also these uh, buildings are um, changing uh, with time. Yeah, again, it's a deformation of uh, a few millimeters per year. So it's incredible how precise now this information has become. And with the, uh, the advent of GMS, we'll be able to provide this information continuously in the future uh, for the next decades. So I think I have to stop because otherwise we will not have lunch. Uh, the presentation is much longer, but you have a lot of videos uh, which uh, uh, explain you um, all these things which I've been telling you. So you can use them for schools, obviously. I selected just videos where uh, the information is given in a simple way. They are not intended for scientists. And uh, in the end, you also have the websites where you can download all the information which are contained in, in the presentation in order to update this information in the next years. And that's concludes my presentation.